thanks for being here. And uh, you're my guinea pigs, all right? <laughs> so uh, yeah, today is gonna be about uh, exoplanets with, uh, with Webb. So there's Webb and some transiting planets there. So um, what is the history of exoplanets? There's been a lot of uh, speculation about planets for a long time. So the Greeks definitely wondered about planets around other worlds. So, uh, come on in. So, uh, uh, so there is some documented uh, writings of people thinking about exoplanets. Also, during the Renaissance, uh, Giordani, Bruno, Copernicus, Galileo all postulated about exoplanets. So, it was a dangerous field to work in, right? Because uh, Bruno got burned to the stake. Galileo <laughs> almost got burned to the stake. But for some reason, they let off Copernicus. Right, when you know they're talking about uh, other worlds and all and all that, and um, then we had planets in our outer solar system. The Kuiper Belt discovered, and there have been searches for exoplanets around the stars, trying to search whether stars are perturbed. You know, you the exoplanets aren't very bright; it's been hard to observe them. But maybe you could see the stars wobbling. So actually, like starting with people like Struve doing uh, astrometry. Actually, he was he was later, but. Uh, uh, and like pickering and whatnot with micrometers, Blick and whatnot, people have been looking for exoplanets uh, by seeing if uh, the motions of their stars. And the first exoplanets were discovered, uh, these once around these weird stars in 1992, actually uh, post main sequence stars, pulsars. Uh, so they're probably charred pretty well because the stars uh, lost their atmospheres. And then um, around uh, 51 peg, uh, B in 1995, that was the first exoplanet found around a sun-like star. And uh, then many more followed. That was found by the radial velocity uh, method by Michel Mayor. And, uh, and since then, they've been a lot been found uh, by radial velocity. That was King until uh, Kepler launched around uh, 2010. And then also transits and direct imaging, there have been a number found by uh, that technique. And there are about 5,500 known today. So we can't go there yet. Mm -hmm. So we have to learn about them through indirect means. And it really is like, uh, you know, the tale of the, of, of the man and the elephant trying to figure out what, uh, you know, what these exoplanets are like, because these different techniques teach us different things about uh, these planets. So these are sort of like the four major techniques that have been used to find and sometimes characterize planets. The uh, radio velocity, that was the first. Uh, and it makes really precise measurements of the velocity of the star. So the first planets were massive and close to the star, these things called hot Jupiters. They would perturb the mass of the stars by um, meters per second. So uh, 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 a meter per second is, uh, so it's like three and a half feet per second. So that's, uh, so like a meter and a half per second is probably like 10 miles an hour. So that's the kind of sensitivity you have to have to measure the uh, the stars. And that's pretty high precision. They're doing uh, almost 10 times better than that now, especially with like on Keck, there's this thing called the Keck Planet Finder, it's much higher precision. And, uh, but it's most sensitive to massive planets close to stars. And then transits became a thing. Uh, I think the first transiting planet, maybe 1998. And, uh, this is, uh, and people had ideas well before that. This guy David Black and NASA Ames uh, had this idea and he got, uh, he got this guy Bill Berufi interested. So, and the, I'll show you more about transits, but uh, the idea is, is that uh, if you lined up with the solar system of another star just right, you can watch the planets move in front of the star and that will make the star dim. Uh, gravitational microlensing, well, uh, gravity can bend the light of planets. And direct imaging, well, you just have a, you just blot out the light of the star. And if you do it well, you can see faint planets nearby. It's hard to do it well. So uh, these are the pictures of the different techniques. The uh, radial velocity is just looking for just like the Doppler shift, just like you go down the Caltrain tracks, the train's coming towards you and the pitch uh, increases of the, of the train uh, horn. And uh, so the light is bluer and the train moves away from you when the, when the uh, star is orbiting this way. And uh, the light is slightly uh, longer wavelength. 
and you, like just the analogy analogy of the Caltrain moving away from you and the pitch is lower. Uh, transit, this is when uh, uh, a planet moves in front of the star. If the, pla if, the, if the planet's over here, the star is brighter and then it moves in front of the star and the star dips, that's this little graph of etc. And uh, microlensing here, so what happens is there's a boost if uh, the planet is uh, in between us and a uh, background object and uh, it will actually help focus the light of uh, this background object and it makes it uh, brighter and there are these, whoops, I think I hit that button. The, uh, it's just amazing that this kind of stuff works, this gravitational lensing works. So this will so it'll make like a background star brighter for like hours or something like that and it's caused by, and they can work out the mass and it's planets that it's causing that. And there have been a few dozen found by uh, microlensing. But uh, you know, the lion's share have been found by uh, transit. So I think like hundreds, maybe close to a thousand this way, and you know, close to 5,000 this way. Direct imaging, a few dozen. And uh, so this is this famous system, HR-8799, that's got uh, uh, four planets shown here. I think there's also uh, maybe a fifth one here. This is the first one, and then uh, these other ones discovered. And this is the star that's being imperfectly suppressed. Uh, this is the, just kind of just geometry of transits. So this is the idea again, if you're looking at a star and if you get lucky, the planet moves between you and the star and the brightness dips by like about one or 2%. If the system looks like this, then you'll never see the planet transit, right? Because uh, it never goes in front of the star. So you really want a geometry like that. This is just a little, uh, uh, GIF of the uh, planet moving in front of the star, and can you see it's only dropping by about uh, two percent? This uh, this chart is pretty accurate. So this is like the brightness of the star. But not, a lot of you, I mean, you've probably tried to measure transits, right, with your own telescopes. Has anybody tried that? All right, very good. And uh, so. What do you learn? So it turns out that the size of this dip when the planet moves in front of the star is just proportional to the area that the planet blocks, okay? So it's just, uh, the, the depth of that dip is just uh, uh, the area of the planet divided by the area of the star. And uh, so if you've got a big planet or a small star, you've got a bigger dip. And uh, it turns out stars are pretty well known, so we can uh, pretty much get an idea of the, of the radius, the size of the star, so we can get, derive the radius of the planet from that. So this is what a uh, uh, sun-like star looks like with an Earth transiting it. So uh, doesn't look so good. Uh, it's about uh, one part in, uh, so uh, Jupiter is about one-tenth of the, uh, radius of the sun. So uh, Jupiter is uh, about one one hundredth of the area. Uh, that's actually, it must be bigger than Earth, it looks more like a Neptune or something. So uh, something like an Earth is about one one hundredth the radius of the sun. So the transit's only gonna be about 0.01% uh, um, of the brightness of the sun if an Earth moves in front of the sun. It's hard to measure. And, uh, but things get better if you move to a smaller star. You, uh, be, again, because the depth of the transit is proportional to the area. So if you want to study small transits, and uh, small planets, look around small stars. And um, that's actually uh, not a bad thing because most of the stars in the Milky Way are small. Most of them are a lot smaller than the sun. There's a lot of red dwarfs. And the way it works is that there are a lot more small stars than big stars. And planets are also more common around small stars than they are around big stars. So um, there's something to that. And a lot of the planets that have been found by transiting have been small planets around uh, small, small stars and uh, small main sequence stars tend to be cool. All right, so this is like a money plot of the known transiting planets. It's a little old, I made that last month. No, oh, oh, two months ago now, August 1st. So this is a plot, this is the orbital period, and uh, this is the mass of the planet in Jupiter masses. So Earth is here, it's about like 365 days, right? And it's about uh, uh, 
one three hundredth of a Jupiter mass. And uh, Uranus, Jupiter here. Now, uh, this is, uh, there are a lot of planets here and the colors are by the technique they were discovered. Uh, one interesting thing here is that uh, all the techniques that we have mostly probe things pretty close, closer to uh, the, their stars than Earth is to the sun, at least in orbital periods. Now, there are some other techniques that uh, do go uh, a little longer. Radial velocity, you beat on something long enough, you can get the long period ones. Direct imaging, there are things definitely far away. So uh, we can sample that out, but direct imaging isn't sensitive to the uh, small planets because they're really faint compared to their stars. The other thing that uh, stands out about this is that there are lots of planets here where we have nothing in our solar system, right? Most of the planets are all really close to uh, uh, their stars. And most of the planets tend to be, there, there are a lot here that have masses uh, between the uh, Uranus and uh, Jupiter. So there's this mass range here that's, uh, we have nothing in our solar system because you know, we have this gap in our solar system. So that makes you think that everybody else is pretty weird. And when you think everybody else is pretty weird, often it's you're the one that's weird, right? And this has been just our way of going about astronomy. Every time we've thought that things are like our solar system, like the Earth, we were wrong, right? First we thought that the sun revolved around the Earth, wrong. Uh, then we thought that, uh, uh, let's see, that the Earth's at the center of the Milky Way, wrong. <laughs> and yeah, the sun and the Earth, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and we started looking, one of the reasons why it took a long time for people to uh, find these extrasolar planets is because they were looking for things that had much longer orbital periods, because they didn't think there could be something like a Jupiter in a four day period. So we were wrong about that too. All right, so there are a lot we would like to know. So uh, let's see, why are uh, so many exoplanets unlike ones in our solar system, both their mass and locations? Uh, what are they made out of? And that, those two things are actually related because if we can understand what they're made out of, we can understand maybe where they formed in the solar system. And there've been a lot of theories about that. And we also know like in our solar system, the gas giants are further out. They probably had to form out there too because they needed to have frozen out water, uh, methane, other ices. And uh, the rocky ones uh, are close in and uh, the ices and whatnot evaporated. Let me see if I can get a, uh, a pointer. And um, also, we like to understand how they are influenced and similar to their host stars. Because if they have like different compositions than their host stars, that can tell us something about where they formed. And also, most of these are really close to their stars. So they're being influenced. Uh, they're being irradiated strongly. So we kind of have to separate out the impact of the star from uh, what's going on in the planet. So this is how transit spectroscopy works. This is this technique we use to uh, study uh, what's in the atmosphere of a planet. So we, uh, if a planet transits the uh, star, you can take the light, you can divide it up, and you get these absorption lines that are both in the star and the planet. You can subtract what was in the star, and you get just what's in the planet itself. So it's a lot like the transit technique, but we disperse the light into its constituent colors. And uh, that is the technique that Webb is using on pretty much all of the planets that it's observing. It's a little bit by imaging, but mostly the spectroscopy technique. And uh, the corollary to this spectroscopy technique is that you know planets go around the whole orbit. Not only do they pass in front of their stars, they also can pass behind their stars. This is something that I'm really um, trying to exploit in uh, my program on Webb. And, uh, it's called a secondary eclipse uh, technique. So if the planet is gonna pass behind the star, but isn't behind the star yet, when well, you see both the star and the planet, and then the planet moves behind the star and the star flux drops a little bit, like way under a percent. The, 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 the eclipse dips are definitely smaller than the uh, planet dips. And let's see if I can do that. So this kind of shows a little video of the uh, secondary eclipse of the planet uh, going behind the star. So it's going on its orbit there. And then as it gets close to the star, the light from the star drops because you're not, you're just looking at the star now. And then it's gonna pop out and you see both and the light goes up again. 
So that way you actually see light directly from the planet, which is pretty cool. So we can probe with these two techniques of the transit or transmission spectroscopy and emission or eclipse spectroscopy, <laughs> different depths in an atmosphere. So this is what's going on in the atmosphere of a giant planet, something like uh, Jupiter, uh, Uranus, Neptune. This shows uh, what uh, temperature, actually this, this one's a pretty hot planet and because uh, it must be close to a star. And it these plots are like temperature as a function of altitude. So uh, uh, this is one bar, so that's like surface pressure on Earth. So these techniques can probe down to like a bar or a few bars. So uh, that's the emission sea is a little deeper. Transmission sea is really high, like up in the stratosphere. And uh, we can look for this photochemistry, we can look for clouds, and uh, we can see whether, uh, we can actually measure these temperature profiles and see what uh, species there probably are at different altitudes and whether uh, it makes sense. There are, this is quite the, the figure here. So what this shows is that um, these are different molecules uh, with the different colors. And this shows sort of their uh, characteristic spectra, their uh, fingerprints. So if you take, uh, these molecules will absorb light at different colors, at different wavelengths. So uh, it, like, for example, uh, let's go out to 15 microns. Let's see if, oh, is there CO2? Oh yes, there is a CO2 absorption here. So uh, we've got a uh, CO2 absorption. So this is uh, uh, higher is more absorption out here. And uh, it's quite strong. That's causing a problem today because um, we're putting more CO2 in the atmosphere at Earth. And uh, what's happening is, is the Earth is emitting primarily out of these wavelengths, because the Earth's about 300 Kelvin, which means it's gonna emit uh, at these wavelengths. And uh, the CO2 in the atmosphere is absorbing it. It's making the atmosphere hotter. And bad things are happening. So uh, there are fingerprints for all sorts of molecules. There's uh, water vapor uh, that Hubble sees. This is the HST that's Hubble, and that's uh, these blue features. It's what's pretty much in its band pass. Hubble's got a pretty uh, restricted band pass of uh, this instrument's like 1.1 to 1.7 microns. Give you an idea. So, you know, the eye sees down to about here. So, uh, H alpha, a lot of you probably imaged mm -hmm. in H alpha, right? It's so what, 65, 60, what's the wavelength for in, in nanometers? What was that? 6563. Yeah, 6563. All right. Yeah. I always forget. So then, so then, so that's, the, that, the, so this is, you know, just a different units of micron. So like 6563 is probably about here. That's where H alpha is. Webb sees much longer wavelengths. You know, we see from about here, from about 0.6 or 600 nanometers out to like 28 microns. And so it's sensitive to all these different uh, molecular features, these features and spectra of different molecules. So we can understand, we can, probe what's in the atmospheres of exoplanets, uh, much more so than we could just with Hubble, which is mostly just sensitive to water and some weak features of CO2 and methane and all of that. But, uh, uh, yes? Uh, does it just, uh, does it get way more complicated when there's multiple planets orbiting one star? Do you then have to like subtract because it could be coming from either planet? So do oh you yeah, just, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll show you this Trappist okay. system. We had to like really carefully plan when we were making our observations. Mm -hmm. Now it turns out because the, the, this transit stuff requires pretty close alignment. Yeah. So it's rare to have more than one or two transiting planets in a system. Yeah. But there's this one system that's got seven and they're all fast. Yeah. And so we had to throw out like the, you know, it's like the, the place that runs web, we're scheduling our observations and we have to throw out like half the observations because they're gonna be contaminated. So mm -hmm. you have to have like these models to figure out what's where when. Okay, so Hubble characterized about 70 exoplanet atmospheres, mostly looking for water over like 10 years. That's the length of time that this wide field camera three was on there. But it has gone down to shorter wavelengths. It's gone down to uh, ultraviolet. Now, Webb is gonna characterize, it's already characterized about 70. It's uh, been operating a little over a year. And uh, I think the first two years, it's doing 100 over a much larger wavelength, with much higher precision. And uh, so it's already blowing Hubble out of the water and we're just kind of getting, publishing the data, but uh, the data are mostly in hand. And I'm very happy 
So I got some web data today uh, mm -hmm. for uh, one of these planets that I'm going to show you. And it looks like it's good. So these are the planets that Hubble characterized and also some ground-based stuff did before um, web launched. And so these planet masses, they, so this is in terms of Earth masses, uh, all pretty big. So not much uh, less than 10 Earth masses. And these are the sizes. So 10, so uh, uh, 11 Earth radii is the size of Jupiter. And uh, yeah, that there must be, uh, no, it's not Jupiter itself. But uh, so Jupiter would be like about right here. And uh, so these things that are uh, bigger than Jupiter's and uh, also pretty massive is what was known beforehand. And with uh, Webb, we're looking at uh, cooler planets. So this is actually slightly different. This is a temperature plot. So these are things uh, we're doing a lot less than like 1500 or 1000 Kelvin and uh, also low masses. So we're doing a lot that are below one Earth mass and uh, a whole bunch uh, less than 10. Also sensitive to these planets here, these things are between 10 and 30, like we have nothing in our solar system. So um, it's pretty cool. We're actually uh, starting to figure things out. This result came out uh, quite a while ago. This is early release science program. Uh, first conclusive detection of carbon dioxide in another planet. And uh, so how do you do it? So you, this is the light, it's spread out. So you just uh, image the planet, you put it through uh, this instrument, this is through NERSPEC, and it uh, has a grading, a diffraction grading that just spreads the light out into different constituent colors. And you see that there's more absorption here at this wavelength, and that matches a CO2 molecule. And there are these uh, uh, modelers that will put together hundreds of thousands of models, and they'll vary all of the different molecules, and they will compare it to the data, subtract the models from the data, find the best matches and find the most probable distributions of uh, the molecules. This one here, you can just see it, that it matches it well, but it's also done statistically so you can figure out what the, um, uh, it's what the probability is that it's something else, that it's not real, and also what the significance is of, of the detection. So that was uh, uh, a, uh, a coup, oh, that was expected. Uh, this wasn't, this was like these, see these plots above the curve? That's actually another molecule, this thing called sulfur dioxide. We see it in other planets at other wavelengths too. And that's like a photo product. Uh, things like uh, hydrogen sulfide are getting blown apart in the atmosphere of the planet by the star. Where is this planet located? Uh, that's WASP 39b. Oh. So if you've got uh, Simbad up, you figure out where it is. So I, 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 don't, I don't know where it is. Yeah, so, uh, really so all of these planets that we're looking at are discovered through other facilities, you know, because we have to do a lot of vetting and uh, we're not just gonna waste web time looking for other things. And so this is the program that I'm leading. It's called Manatee. Miri and Nurkam, uh, uh, Miri and Nurkam assay for the transmission emission of exoplanets. It's amazing what people will contort you know, into an acronym. So, uh, and then that's our, 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 yeah. our logo. <laughs> we have stickers. <laughs> so uh, these are our planets. We've got nine planets in this program. And we've got about 90% of them observed now. So this is an order of mass. So this is like a hot Jupiter, uh, 360 Earth masses. So like Jupiter's 318, right? It's about the same mass as Jupiter. 1200 degrees Kelvin, that's pretty toasty. And uh, going all the way down to an Earth mass planet, Trappist-1, uh, at about 400 Kelvin equilibrium temperature. And uh, that's in this uh, system I'll, I'll tell you a little more about later. And these are these um, uh, things called mini-Neptunes. Those are the ones in between the mass of uh, Uranus and, uh, and Neptune. So uh, pretty good sampling of different things. And one thing is that we're uh, really, one thing that's unique about this program, we're looking at a really broad range of wavelengths. When we add in Hubble, Hubble's around one micron. So you see when we go out to like 11 or 12 microns, we're, if we add in Hubble, we're doing a whole decade, a factor of 10 in wavelength, which is just really unprecedented to, uh, and, but it's needed to figure out all that's going on. It's not just the composition, but also understanding clouds and uh, other things in this happening in the atmospheres. All right, so, um, one of the big puzzles of exoplanets is uh, before web launch is that we've seen this uh, molecule methane in cool planets in our solar system 
and it should be the dominant carrier carbon in planets less than about 900 Kelvin, right? So Earth's 300 Kelvin, so you know, hotter, it should be, uh, should be around. So this is in Jupiter, we see it in Saturn, uh, Neptune, Uranus, all this stuff. So why isn't it in an exoplanet? So we put out a reward. And uh, so, uh, and then we found it. And I'll show you some examples of that. So uh, we didn't have to pay out, so we found it ourselves. This is um, first conclusive detection of methane in a planet. Uh, whoops. Yeah, yeah, this is it. So uh, this is uh, WASP 80b. And uh, what's interesting about this is that, uh, remember I showed you there are these two techniques. There's the transit technique and the eclipse technique. We see it both ways, which is pretty cool. The, this top one is the transmission technique. And so you see that's the planet there uh, going in front of the star. And if the, the dots are the data, right? And these models are if, if there were no water, it would be shaped like this. Uh, and if there were no methane, it would be shaped like that. So all that gap there, all over all these wavelengths due to methane. This here, that peak in methane, is this Q branch where the methane has a really strong absorption. Some people call it the middle finger of methane, but it's, a, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an absorption feature there. So uh, very conclusive. This is uh, you know less than like one part in a million that it's something else. And then also an emission here. This is, so this is the planet divided by the star as a function of wavelength, but yeah, wavelength is on this axis. And again, so the methane is at the same wavelengths, but here it's seen an absorption. So uh, if there were no methane in the planet, you would uh, have be orange again. And uh, we see this big gap there. So it's very conclusive. It's like a 10 sigma detection. You put them both together. And uh, so uh, this is, so not only are we detecting it, but it turns out this transmission emission probe different areas. So transmission, probes the edges of the planet, because that's what you see through. Emission probes the face. So we know that the whole, uh, the methane is mixed throughout the whole atmosphere, which is pretty cool. And uh, this is the one that uh, we just got some uh, more data on in uh, the wavelengths adjacent to here. So this is, see, only goes out to like four microns. And so we just got the four to five micron gap. So you can look for carbon dioxide, other carbon molecules there. And this paper is actually, uh, it's available on the archive, but it's gonna be in Nature in uh, probably around the end of the month. It's been accepted in Nature. Then this is one of these many Neptune planets. And uh, what's interesting here is, well, it's, so we're working on this paper. This, this paper is called uh, A Mess of Molecules in a Mini Neptune. This is the Hubble data. So the only thing we knew about it beforehand is it had maybe a little bit of water, just from these two points in Hubble. And, uh, but then we took uh, these data with Webb, the red points, and uh, matches up with our models. This is like one of the best fit models that we've done. So it uh, matches uh, water and uh, matches uh, methane. That's, uh, that's that slope there, the same feature we saw in that previous planet. Sulfur dioxide, maybe, and uh, strong CO2. So this is pretty cool. So we've got uh, uh, methane and CO2. So that helps break the temperature and also um, the, the overall uh, metallicity, the uh, ratio of, uh, of the number of heavy elements compared to hydrogen. And uh, I sent out a, uh, a tirade to my group this morning saying that our data on this planet are gonna go public within a month. Everybody's gonna try to, to publish our, our data since it's a hot planet. So we gotta get our paper out. So hopefully we'll get this thing submitted in about a month. Just saw it here first. <laughs> and then this is um, some of these, uh, I've got some other planets here. This, this is a warm Jupiter and it's showing multiple carbon molecules. So this is like the power I mentioned that uh, we've got a really long uh, wavelength range. So this one goes showing from like two and a half microns out to 12. This is an emission spectrum. So, uh, and we're seeing that uh, there are these absorptions of carbon dioxide, CO, and methane. So we've got all these carbon molecules all on the same planet. And, and when you have that, you can uh, actually figure out through the chemical networks what temperature it has to be, and also the ratio of uh, uh, heavier elements. Because if you have a, a lot more he heavy elements, then it's gonna wanna have more CO2 than CO, 
uh, just to get uh, more atoms in a given molecule. And then maybe also some of this SO2 stuff again, and ammonia. Ammonia has never been detected conclusively in exoplanet again. And it's right here. Then uh, this is another emission spectrum of another planet. This is like a warm Saturn. So it's like a, a mass of about 100 Earths. And it's a little warmer than the last one. And it's uh, uh, got a lot of molecules too. And one of the things about this is that uh, we had to model it with some inhomogeneous uh, hazes on it in order to get it to fit the spectrum. So not only can we uh, figure out what's in it, we can figure out like uh, cloud patterns and whatnot on the planet. And then it's probably stationary given uh, how it's being irradiated by its star. All right, so a lot of people wanna know about smaller planets, rocky ones, right? Things like Earth. What are we learning about them? and uh, their atmospheres, habitability, etc. So you come to the right place for that. Well, let's first look at what we can learn in, uh, about them. So again, this is a spectrum. So this is just, uh, if you look at Mars, Earth, Venus, the rocky planets in our solar system with atmospheres, and you uh, kind of spread their light out into different colors, you see that uh, there's this, uh, as I mentioned before, a big uh, carbon dioxide feature, around 15 microns, and uh, Mars has it. So does anybody know like the, how thin the Mars atmosphere is compared to ours? Yeah. It's like a quarter. It's, uh, the surface pressure on Mars is less than one one hundredth of it is oh, on Earth. Oh. Yeah, it's like seven or, or the, the, the rule of thumb is yeah, 10 millibars, and we're one bar. So that's a yeah, factor of 100. So even though there's like nothing, it's got a really thin atmosphere, uh, CO2 is a very strong absorber. You can't see down to the uh, surface of the CO2 band. It's like, if you look at it in, in the CO2 wave lengths, you're seeing only high in the atmosphere where it's cold. That's why it looks, uh, uh, that's why you have this big dip there because it's uh, looking at uh, colder temperatures. Earth has got CO2. Venus has got a lot of CO2. See how broad that is? That's because the pressure in Venus is really high. And then that makes uh, the, uh, that, that broadens the line there. So, and so this is, so Venus got like a hundred times our atmospheric pressure. Earth is about one, right? Mars is one, 100. So I never thought of it that way. Hmm. That's quite a range of pressures there. But, you know, we all have this common feature, all CO2. Uh, what else does Earth have? So that's ozone, right? And where does this ozone come from? You wouldn't expect it to be there chemically because uh, uh, all of the O should be in things like H2O, water, CO2. Uh, and, uh, but it turns out that Earth has this chemical imbalance in its atmosphere because it, their, their stuff taking energy and, uh, from the sun and making oxygen, it's called plants, right? They're turning CO2 into O2. And uh, it turns out that up in the upper atmosphere, uh, the photons from the sun can hit some of this O2, uh, knocks off uh, uh, atoms, and some of it forms uh, ozone, so O3. So this is how we are sensitive to oxygen. O2 doesn't really have any really strong wavelengths, uh, trick, uh, any strong, yeah, the O2 molecule doesn't have any strong absorptions at these wavelengths. So you see this out of balance, and on Earth, this is a uh, uh, characteristic of life. Now, you could get O2 abiotically, like if you boil off your oceans, which hopefully we won't do, but we're going down that road and we should probably stop dumping a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere because uh, if you put in too much, you get in this runaway greenhouse. And we'll boil off our oceans and uh, don't want to go there earlier than we have to. So we can look for stuff like this. That's, that's, that's the long-winded uh, conclusion. And where do we look? So it turns out there's a really interesting system called TRAPPIST-1. It's a, it's a small planet, which means you can, excuse me, it's a small star, which means you can see small planets well. How small of a star is it? It's the smallest thing you can still call a star. If it was any smaller, it would be a brown dwarf. It wouldn't be fusing hydrogen in its core. Hmm. So, uh, and then it's only about 20% bigger than the diameter of Jupiter. It's uh, phenomenal. It weighs about 85 times as much as Jupiter. And that really is the brown dwarf limit. It's about 85 times. And uh, this shows 
uh, where its planets are. Uh, so the remarkable thing, it's got seven rocky planets that we have found through transits. This was discovered in 2016 and 2017. Then uh, Earth, we've got four rocky planets uh, out at uh, this orbital period. But because this star is so uh, much smaller than the sun, these planets get about the same heating from their star as our rocky planets get from the sun. It's this great little miniature solar system. And it's pretty close as far as such things go. It's about 13 parsecs, 39 light years, 40 light years away. And so just some schematic pictures of how the TRAPPIST-1 system fits into our solar system. Mm -hmm. All, so these seven planets are all well within the orbit of Mercury. So I think TRAPPIST-1b is like one one hundredth of the distance, one one hundredth of an eighty, one one hundredth distance between Earth and the Sun. And uh, so, and then the temperatures here are green is sort of like where water can be liquid on the surface, often called the habitable zone. So it's sort of like, so Venus, Earth, Mars, they're pretty uh, much uh, comparable to D, E, F, G there. So we could study uh, the systems. The other really interesting thing about M stars is that they are, let me see if I had it on this slide. Yeah, so about, um, so it's something like 90% of uh, Earth-sized planets in our galaxy are gonna have an M star for their sun and not a sun-like star because there are a lot more M stars and M stars are more likely to have planets. So uh, getting back to our Trappist system here, so B and C are too hot for water, but C is kind of a lot like Venus. You'd expect this, these both, they've been all these models at the Wazoo, I'll show you one, where they've uh, been expecting lots of CO2 and, uh, uh, and having carbon, active carbon cycles and whatnot. D, E, F are like in these areas called the habitable zone where water could potentially be liquid. And this is probably where water freezes out there. So we can study these things and see what they got, see if, uh, uh, they've got a, uh, uh, atmospheres like uh, our planets or something else. And again, this is just sort of like the illumination. So D gets about the same illumination as Earth. E is actually probably a little better one to study. And uh, C is like Venus. B is a little more than Venus, etc. But M stars have issues. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me go back to the slide and show you. This is this one I had, uh, the, the, the place that runs web did this for me for a press release. At Star's angry. <laughs> we, we, I asked them to make that star look angry because that's, that's the, uh, the Trappist star. And, and why is it angry? Well, it evolves slowly. It turns out that the sun is massive enough so that um, it contracted fairly quickly to, uh, get hot enough just to uh, burn hydrogen on the main sequence. It was about 10 million years, roughly, for the sun to go from uh, after its formation to uh, go to hydrogen burn. And uh, uh, M dwarfs, though, so uh, that this is something that weighs like uh, less than one-tenth of the sun. It can take a billion years. So that's a uh, hundred times longer. So that means that the star and, and while they're contracting, they're a lot brighter than they are now. So that meant that something now that's uh, bathing a planet in a temperate way would have been a lot brighter and it would have been blasting its planet with a lot more flux uh, for a long time. And early on is a critical time because that's when the planets are outgassing their atmospheres and uh, you know, lots of volcanism and carbon cycles, etc. Also, um, M dwarfs are quite active. There are uh, been found to have a lot of x-rays uh, and flaring and also visible light. We've actually seen this one. I was uh, reviewing a paper for a journal on, on this star and it's like they couldn't see anything on the planet because the star was doing all this, uh, all, having all this activity. Uh, maybe, probably also having these coronal mass ejections like we have on Earth. You know, they've taken out satellites. They took out a bunch of Starlink satellites. Uh, when the sun had a big mass ejection, when uh, some satellites are going up into orbit. They, you know, you get these high energy uh, protons from the sun, come hit the atmosphere of the earth, uh, heat it up, cause it to get bigger. And uh, so it's just dumping uh, 
a, a, lo a lot of uh, high energy radiation into the atmosphere of the planets. And that happens for a while. Uh, the atmosphere is going to get boiled off. And this system is about seven and a half billion years old. It's older than our system. So the stuff has probably been going on for a while around uh, M stars. Also, uh, uh, all, the st all the planets in these systems on M stars are tidally locked. And most of these transiting planets are. I haven't gone into too much. But uh, what that means is that the, the um, um, it's like the moon is to us, right? You only see one side of the moon. So uh, one side is going to get blasted by the star. The, uh, it's always going to be twilight on the limbs. And the, and the back side is going to be colder. This is a little demo here of uh, the uh, star surface getting, uh, the star blasting the surface of the planet as it goes around and is tidally locked. And that shows how the phase of the planet varies. So if you actually, if you observe a whole orbit, you can see the night side and you see the day side and you can measure the difference. That's actually, we got some time for uh, this coming year in Webb to do that for one of these Trappist planets. Look at the difference between the day and the night side. This shows this billion years of the star cooling down. So uh, for example, this planet D is right now, it's in this thing, this habitable zone, water can uh, exist on it, but it took, uh, a thousand million years for the star to get cool enough for this to happen. So, billion years. Long time to get blasted. This is a, uh, there, there, there's a lot of scientists out there, very active imagination. So these people trying to model these terrestrial planets around their stars. And this is uh, one of the more uh, complicated models. It's called Pac-Man. Kind of looks like Pac-Man, right? <laughs> so you've got this stuff going on. You've got uh, uh, radiation coming in from the star. You've got, uh, which is causing uh, hydrogen to escape from the atmosphere. There is uh, uh, magma under the uh, surface. It's uh, interacting with uh, the surface and uh, outgassing through volcanoes. And then the carbon also from the volcanoes will come and get subducted back into the planet here. So this is kind of like what happens on Earth. And they can uh, model this for different uh, uh, masses of planets and uh, try to figure out for these Trappist planets what, uh, you know, sort of what the possibilities are. They ran, so they, they ran this model for uh, this Trappist 1b planet and they uh, thought, they thought it actually was kind of a crapshoot that uh, in terms of whether it's going to have an atmosphere. So they, they were predicting uh, some of the models had the strong CO2 absorption. This is the one we saw before at 15 microns wavelength. And, uh, but if it was just, the planet was just a, uh, a bare rock, it would not have these features indicative of having molecules in the atmosphere. So, uh, you know, this is one way you can look at to see what the planet is. So, uh, my team did some observations. We looked in this filter and, uh, the idea is, is that if there was a strong CO2 atmosphere, it would be pretty cold and uh, because of this absorption of CO2, it wouldn't be very bright. So this is, so the planet would be less than 200 parts per million as bright as the star. And however, if it was more like a uh, bare rock or a perfect uh, absorber and radiator, it'd be more like uh, 400 parts per million. And this is if it redistributed its heat perfectly around the planet. Now, what do we get? Uh, we got something a lot hotter than the bare rock scenario. And that's easy to understand. So we actually measured temperature 500 degrees. And if it was a bare rock, you know, uh, that redistributes heat, it would have been more like 400. So what's going on is that the heat is all staying on the day side of the planet. We looked at the day side of the planet and uh, that's what you get here. So this is uh, uh, no heat redistribution, absorbing 100% of the flux on it. That's what a zero VO means. And then re-radiating perfectly. Also consistent, so this is the, the line that we measured. It's like 500 degrees. This is the uncertainty, just given the uh, amount of data that we have. Uh, also consistent with there being some internal heating, like from tides, you know, Io gets heated when it goes around Jupiter and all that. And then this is uh, uh, other atmosphere. So this, if it had, had one of these thick carbon dioxide or oxygen and carbon dioxide atmospheres, it would have been predicted to be like here. We really rule that out quite substantially. That's many, many error bars away. And then this is if uh, it had been just that uh, uh, uniformly uh, uh, re-radiating the heat it got from a star, it would be there. 
and then these are other atmospheres where there's some absorption there. So very little or no atmosphere in TRAPPIST-1b. So don't buy real estate on <coughs> planets around M stars, all right? That's my tip of the day. Uh, this is this graphic, the Space Telescope Science Institute put out. So this was uh, what we measured, the temperature of TRAPPIST-1, about 500 Kelvin, and uh, uh, that was the measured one, and this is the model that there had been uh, um, no redistribution of heat. And then, uh, so Earth is over here, like 300 Kelvin. It's a lot hotter on the day side. Now, the night side is probably really cold. And we're going to measure that when we do one of these phase curves and see the, um, uh, and, and observe it long enough to see the, uh, the night side of the planet, too. This is just, we observed just the, uh, the day side. And uh, do we have Mercury? Yeah, so Mercury is like uh, over here. So, a little disappointing, but. It's the first time we've actually been able to constrain anything about an atmosphere of a planet the size of Earth in another uh, stellar system, in another solar system. So, starting to make some progress here. So, um, I gotta ask this question. Uh, could it be a Mars-like atmosphere on there? You know, it's like, because we saw that Mars got a lot less of an atmosphere, and the answer is no. It's like, even though Mars has a much weaker atmosphere, this is where uh, our, our, our measured point is. Um, let's cross here. These are these different atmospheric models. Mars would be down here. This is, uh, again, this causes a strong CO2 absorption. And so we can rule this out pretty conclusively that, uh, uh, the, that even an atmosphere uh, one one hundredth of the pressure of Earth is not on this planet. So. Uh, what about other planets in the in the system? All right, so there was another program to observe another planet in a very similar way. And uh, so I had actually been pretty conservative about observing 1b because I thought the thing was gonna be cold. I need a lot of observations. So we observed it five times, but we could, it was so hot and so bright. We saw it each time. We didn't have to add up everything. So uh, this other program was gonna do 1c and I thought, oh, that thing is just gonna be impossible, you know, but it turns out they got it pretty well because it's also hot and it has little or no atmosphere. So this is like no atmosphere uh, line. This is the measurement. So the, it's the uncertainty. So it's almost consistent with there. It uh, could have a thin atmosphere uh, or uh, like some non-zero albedo. It could have this uh, ultramafic rock or whatever. So um, two planets. So this is the one that's supposed to be the spitting image of Venus. It does not have an atmosphere anything like Venus. So, uh, uh, not looking good. Again, don't buy real estate on an star planet. So both of these here, we've, got, we've gotten both of these now. No atmosphere, thin or no atmosphere. People are trying to like observe these things with this other technique, this transmission. It's a harder road. Uh, but this, this emission technique that we use, it gets harder as you go out too. So, uh, I think we should observe this one. It's probably gonna take about between 100 and 400 hours. And this is the one that's supposed to be the dead ringer for Earth uh, in, in the system. But it's gonna take some time in order to get a signal, to figure out if it's just a hot rock or not. I think we can figure that out in 100 hours. And if it's got an atmosphere, I think, and we start studying it, that's probably gonna be um, uh, 400 hours. So thank you for your time and uh, stay tuned for more results. And there are always more results and uh, a couple places where they come out, webtelescope.org. Uh, there's also a web blog, but you probably see that, you know, just w whenever something comes out, there are like a thousand web stories. It's amazing. So thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes? Can you give us a sense of how the time on JWST is allocated to exoplanets versus uh, early universe versus other purposes. And yeah. How much that's, time you actually personally have obtained. Yeah, so it's it's pretty interesting. So I was in some of the web first web science groups, like nineteen ninety eight, and we were trying to think just big picture things. Exoplanets really weren't even on the map then. But uh I was with this other guy. This guy's a pretty big visionary. We had a meeting about what it, what Webb could do with exoplanets about 10 years ago. And he said, I think Webb's going to get, exoplanets get 25% of the time on Webb. Everybody gasped because people thought that Webb was all, only going to be looking at the early universe.
but it turns out that um, they give out time in proportion to the requests. And it turns out about 25% of the time is going to the early universe, high, high uh, redshift galaxies, whatnot. 25% of the time is going to exoplanets. 25% is uh, going to stars and uh, uh, and stellar systems. Uh, and then uh, about uh, the rest is solar system, uh, AGN and whatnot. So about, uh, and if anything, the time for exoplanets is going up. I think it might be the highest fraction now. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've got um, my manatee programs about 220 hours or something, which is one of the larger programs for this. Yeah. No, uh, so it's sort of a two part question on this. So with all the different types of cameras on there, there's a few I think you can use at the same time, is that right? Or do you have to be looking at different things? I'm just wondering if some of your data you can get it at the exact same time or you have to, or that is why you're doing having to take like a, a hundred hours. So that, that the second part is about what, what, why do you need a hundred hours? What are the... Yeah, so uh, each transit, it takes roughly, it takes about two hours for uh, a planet to transit. And you want to observe before and after because you need to have a baseline so you can measure that dip. And it takes a while to stabilize before you get there. So uh, you want to observe about uh, two and a half times the length of the transit plus some stabilization time. And it takes an hour to slew to get there. We get charged for that. So, uh, you know, transit's like seven hours. And yeah, it's only pretty much one instrument at a time because mm -hmm. you can observe multiple instruments at a time, but they see things next to each other. Now, caveat is that one of the instruments, NERCAM, that's the one I was on, we have these dichroics, which is pretty cool. So long wave, so we can observe something in both longer wavelengths, so we can get a spectrum of the planet, while we're uh, observing it in shorter wavelengths, and we can uh, measure the brightness. Mm -hmm. So that's something we do do there. But uh, in order to get the big wavelength coverage, yeah, unfortunately, we do have to go back and uh, observe multiple transits which has its own can of worms, because as you know, and as you'll see in a few weeks when you look at the sun with a sun filter, uh, stars have spots. And these uh, smaller stars have more spots, and they move, and uh, it can make interpreting transits uh, challenging at times. Any more questions? Yeah. Is there any sort of like uh, gas composition in like the atmosphere that you could look at and say like, this planet very likely does have life on it, or can you just say, oh, these planets can support life? Well, people are pretty good at making stuff up. So this is yeah. a paper that came out a couple <laughs> weeks ago by an eminent professor at the University of Cambridge in the UK, where he said, these kind of planets could have life. And there's this wavelength range of this thing called DMS, dimethyl sulfide, which is caused by decay. And uh, so the, the, uh, thing is, is that for looking, okay, first off, it's going to be hard to understand uh, life in a large scale in these planets that are mostly gas, you know, things like, like these Jupiters and are hot. Those are the ones we're most sensitive to. Getting down to these Earth-like planets, we're just trying to figure out they have an atmosphere, right, yeah. and like the major things. And looking for life is going to be a little tricky in terms of the balance. Maybe if we added enough data, but yeah, you can look at things like that uh, ozone signature. It's uh, one of the things, so, uh, uh, but it's not clear whether it's uh, produced by life or whether it's abiotic, you know, like in the case of oxygen, uh, uh, oceans being boiled off. So uh, there are clues. We're working on a new observatory called Habitable Worlds Observatory. It'll probably be launched in about 20 years. And we'll probably use the uh, direct imaging technique and be able to address that question better. Yeah. Some people are interested in there. My argument, a lot of people like that give the money out are interested in that. And my argument is, why do we care about those? We've got four in our solar system. You know, we have Earth, we have Mars, we have Venus. We'll know more about those than anything out there, these are things. But, you know, you, t you, you raise a good point. People want to know. I mean, we've been asking these questions for a long time, uh, as long as civilization. Uh, 
sort of like where did we come from you know that's the nature of the uh of the universe at whole uh, uh let's see what else is out there are we alone you know that's a big question so that's why i think people are interested in the earth-like planets i'm personally uh pretty interested in these things that are unlike any planet in our own solar system because it looks like most of the planets in the galaxy are unlike things around our, our own solar system these things that are bigger than neptune and uranus and uh uh uh, smaller than them and uh, bigger than Earth. So like, uh, why don't we have any of those things? So people are interested in uh, planets around other stars for different reasons, but you know, so I think, you know, we all have uh, interest in what else is out there. And then there are different paths that scientists could go down. Well, let's see. Have you ever tried to get like a family together across the bay? That's <laughs> a lot further. <laughs> <Not there. laughs> so, uh, not super practical. And it's, I haven't worked it out, but it'll take a lot of energy to do that. You know, it could take as you wonder if, the, where, where does all our energy come from here? It comes from the sun. You know, even like oil and stuff. That came from the sun. That's like decomposed plants. So you add up all the energy the sun puts out for like a hundred years, is that enough to move some number of people to another planetary system in a century? I don't know, but probably pretty close. <laughs> um, yeah, back there. Well, there's some fairly fundamental uh, implicit assumptions as to what the chemistry of life uh, would have to be to, as, as you sort of look at the signatures and so forth. Yes, and I will put forth my, uh, I'll postulate, put forth my theory that, you know, every time we've made assumptions, they've been wrong, okay? Mm -hmm. So, well, we do kind of know carbon-based life, you know, earth-based life and all that. And people have studied life in extreme environments. They've put cameras down around these sulfur vents in the ocean that are like, where boiling water is coming out and there are these crustaceans there and all this stuff. Uh, people have theorized about uh, silicon-based life. I don't really know much about it, but uh, there are different theories. It does take, uh, other people have these theories of follow the energy and that you need to have some uh, uh, process that could convert uh, available energy, whether it's like starlight or something, you know, into uh, uh, fuel for uh, cells and all that stuff. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, so um, one theory is, is that so most of the ones we see are the systems that are a lot closer to their stars. Uh, we could have had things like that and they got uh, scattered out at early times. Some big things happened in our solar system at early times. Uh, anybody know how the moon came about? Yeah, the year crashed into it. Yeah, right, exactly. Something the size of Mars hit Earth. I mean, there, there, there is stuff going on, you know, at 50 million years into our, our solar system. So there could have been scattering events like that. Uh, I don't know, though. You know, there have been various, I think people put uh, different theories together. There's a paper in the last six months, Stephen Kane, University of California, Riverside, tried to put a super Earth in between Mars and Jupiter in our solar system and dynamically and see what happens. And things didn't go well. The solar system got kind of messed up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you showed a uh, slide <coughs> of the spectra of uh, some of the planets in our uh, in our solar system. Mm -hmm. uh, those spectra, uh, I presume, those spectra were not taken with the JWST. What what would JWST spectra look like for say the Earth? Yeah. So. Um that's kind of like people had modeled this Trappist thing as like an Earth-like planet. So, you know, we would expect to see uh, strong carbon dioxide because it's a really strong absorber. Only It's only strong like water, carbon dioxide. Oh, I see. 
uh, and we would see water vapor. We have water vapor in the atmosphere. Uh, we would see, I'm not sure how strong methane would be. I think you, for the oxygen, you only showed a, a spike for ozone. Yes. Uh, what about for diatomic oxygen? Yeah, that's shorter wavelengths. It's like 760 nanometers. There's this O2 A band, okay. and uh, that is detectable. But uh, um, just because of these techniques and stuff, like particularly the emission technique, you get more sensitive out to the longer wavelengths. So uh, with a different technique, like direct imaging, that is what we're going to be looking for in this Hubble Worlds Observatory, where you blot out the star, and you'll be able to see the light uh, directly reflected from the planet. And that O2 A band is one that's going to be looked for. But there are these astrobiologists, some of which you could hit up, like uh, Nikki Parenteau at, uh, at NASA Ames that you know thinks a lot about these biosignatures, what's like a real biosignature, what's a swap meet biosignature, et cetera. Uh, let's see, uh, yeah. For, uh, I was wondering if people must be thinking about what's beyond JWST for exoplanet research, what's the next big project? I'm, well, I'm working on a little one with Livermore. It's working on it today. It's called Pandora. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. It's a small spacecraft. It's got a half meter uh, mirror, and it's going to do transits. But it's interesting. You don't lose sensitivity super quickly with mirror size. But what Pandora's going to let us do is we'll be able to look at these transiting star and planet systems for a long time. So we'll be able to look uh, for a given transiting system, 10 times, 10 hours each, we'll be able to look through the whole star rotation and how the star misses up the planet signal. So, uh, and we're gonna be using some extra web detectors on that, so that's a fun project. And then on the other end of the scale, there's this thing called Habitable Worlds Observatory that I mentioned. Um, we're just starting to get the science teams together now. It's gonna be about the size of web. It's gonna work at visible and ultraviolet wavelengths, and it's gonna have a, uh, very high performance coronagraph. So we'll be able to blot out the star and suppress it to better than uh, one part in 10 billion. So you can see uh, Earth-sized planets around it. Yeah, and you, you know, this is just about like kind of exoplanets in general. Like, uh, are they always in the same plane with each other? Or do you ever get like kind of all askew? We, yeah, the answer is um, usually, but we don't always know. Uh, you know, with transits, we're only sensitive ones in the same plane, but there's this cool technique that um, if one goes in front of the star, you can measure its velocity when it does that and, and see how it cuts across the star velocity, see if it goes in the same direction the star is. So you see, mm -hmm. we can see whether the orbit of the star is aligned with the orbit of the yeah. rotation. And most of them are, but about 20% aren't. Mm -hmm. You know, our solar system, is it, um, uh, is it is it Neptune or Uranus that's uh, got a uh, pretty big tilt to uh, Uranus? Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they think something happened. struck it. Yeah. That's why. And like Venus as well, because it rotates backwards. Okay. And Daryl, what's the possibility of web detecting exomoons? Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's a hard problem. So uh, yeah, yeah. Ask Kipping about that. So no exomoons have ever been detected. Uh, I don't know, you know, it just the whole transit technique is hard because you, you have like the noise of the star. So, and if the exo, so it might be able to detect a really big exomoon, but it could be hard to tell the difference between a big exomoon and exoplanet. Uh, probably not a lot of time is gonna be given for, you know, searching for things that aren't likely to be there with web. So uh, that's the other thing, you know, is like, uh, or is it going to have the time to do it? Because it's probably, it's competitive enough so the time will be given out to study things that we know are there. You know, that's like planets found other ways, etc. So I don't know, but uh, we could probably get down to like 10 parts per million kind of signals. So if an exomoon could do that, maybe. No, and I think there's one in the back, yeah. Is there any correlation between the age of the star and the type of exoplanets you're finding? Yeah, that's an interesting thing. So most of the planets we've been finding around older stars, because they're easier to find, the stars uh, are less active. So the, the signals don't get uh, as uh, messed up by the star. 
there are only a few young stars, things like 50 million years old and younger. There's this thing in Taurus that we're trying to observe that is, that is younger. Uh, we don't really have enough data to go with, uh, you know, to go with types of planet versus ages to know like how solar systems disintegrate and that sort of thing. But that would be interesting to do. Is it possible to have like two basically like equally sized planets orbiting each other? Is that count as moons if they're equally sized and they're orbiting each other? That's a binary planet. A binary and planet. Uh, I was just talking to Daryl, like, there was this paper about um, binary planetary mass objects being found in Orion that are not associated with stars. So that was this uh, other web result, the star forming region. So uh, uh, it would be hard to get two planets orbiting each other in a system that's also orbiting around a star. Yeah. All right. Oh, yes, in the back. Uh, to touch on your answer from earlier to my question, the professor from Riverside, you said you put a super Earth between Mars and Jupiter orbit. Yeah. And you said things were bad. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that a lot of the inner planets got ejected. I don't know if like Mars got ejected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, they they interacted dynamically in a way that disturbed the structure of our solar system. I guess another question that kind of pops into my head is maybe there's a correlation between uh, these exoplanets that we're finding all over the universe that we're not finding in our solar system, and the fact that we have life here on Earth potentially not uh, suitable. Good point. Good point. Yeah, and then that also plays into the fact that, you know, if you're on an Earth sized planet around a galaxy, there's a 90% chance you've got an M star as your host. And it looks like uh, atmos so far, um, they don't have uh, dense atmosphere. So life might not be super common in our galaxy. The, the other little bit too about all the big planets is right when when our solar system was forming Jupiter was moving inwards towards the Sun and if Saturn didn't form to balance out the gravity it probably would have took all the rocky planets out so if we have if we're, that type of imbalance is more common or in the bigger planet the bigger planets get moved towards the Sun more um, you know could also be why we're not getting as many smaller planets. Uh. Yeah, although um, we still have uh, these little rocky planets in our solar system. We just don't have anything in between the rocky planets and things oh, like yeah, Uranus. Yeah. But, but, that, but like I said, if Jupiter, if Saturn didn't form, supposedly Jupiter would have went in and took out all of right. our rocky right. planets, right? Yeah, but there are other solar systems with little planets that also, but you're right, we uh, don't have a lot of these systems with both little and big planets. Yeah. Thank you.